So once again, guys, what I want to talk about real quickly, and, and uh, it, this is something that I think is important to uh, setting a tone in many ways with faculty, is that we want to um, make sure we have a consistent message as to expectations uh, in regard to uh, teaching, in regard to just about all components of being in the university. And I do it, a weekly email that goes out to uh, faculty, uh, it goes out every Sunday, and I talk about three things that I think are important, and I think it covers everything, but it certainly covers teaching as well. And I always call it the idea of, I use the word CCR when it comes to it, but the idea of building capacity, having compassion, and building connections with students, and being responsive to the needs of students and others out there. And so the reason I do this on a day in day out basis, or at least a weekly basis, and, and why uh, anytime I talk to faculty, it tends to come up and we go through that again, is because I think in many ways this really illustrates um, important factors to being able to have uh, the, the impact that we wanna have in regard to being a professor in a university. And so here is really kind of what I mean when it comes to that is that uh, first of all is that we want to build capacity in students and that really just means having an educational background and so what we talk many times about developing the fundamental knowledge and skills making sure that assignments are meaningful and that we want to create experiences and something that I, I talk about often is uh, I'm kind of a collector of experiences I want to make sure to what extent, uh, extent possible, I can put students in a place where they're not theoretically feeling something, but they are learning in a very meaningful way. And we wanna to try to do that whenever possible. And so we try to highlight times that we do that and we try to get recognition when we do that. And we have other things that we wanna also build that support in faculty, build capacity in faculty, make them better. And the idea that we wanna build a profession, but those are kind of secondary things to the teaching component, but really working on understanding how important some of those particular areas are. You go beyond that is that there is some studies out there that shows to the extent that students feel connected to their professors, that they're gonna learn that much better and work that much harder. And uh, I like things, Dr. Odell for one, at the end of the year last year, all his students took a picture, signed it, made sure that they, uh, that they gave him the credit that uh, he deserved because of all the work that he'd done with them. And so you, you had indication of a great connection going on right there and so we I developed that connection that through self-generated i didn't have anything to do with it <laughs> i know that's what i was saying so okay. they worked with it but that's what you want is you want to make sure that they are connecting with you in very fundamental ways uh so you want to develop them well try to make sure that you remove whatever obstacles are in place right there be an advocate for them and when what i call an ethic of care is making sure they're being cared about during that time uh, mike is showing up his is showing his little plaque right there but uh have that in place so the compassion connection guys I think is an incredibly important part to it all and I want to make sure I reiterate this a little more because a lot of our faculty go in and they feel that if they just provide the information provide the knowledge provide the data then the rest of it doesn't matter and I disagree with that thoroughly I think that you have to go in and make sure that you are connecting in very meaningful ways to the students. And I wanna set that expectation with our faculty every week when I go through and, connect and talk to them. And so it's very clear that that's a valuable part of what I'm looking for. And the final thing is being responsive. And guys, in a online environment, there's nothing more important than being responsive. And so a faculty member that assigns stuff but is not available, really probably harms students more than they help them. And so here's what I mean. Anytime you're in a classroom face-to-face, -face, if a student is lost on something, they can raise their hand uh, and they can get an answer immediately. But in an, in an online environment, you don't get it. And if they don't understand what's going on, and if, it's, if, it's, you know, if there's ambiguity there, then they're trying to contact the professor to get answers so they can move forward and work. And if they don't hear back for a long time, it creates a lot of frustration on the part of the student and uh, it harms them academically. And so I, I discuss, and one of the things that I always say is that I want my uh, faculty members to be very responsive. Now, Dr. Odell and Dr. Oliveris are two of them that 
are uh, working all the time and, and anytime a student needs something, they are right there probably within the next 10, 15 minutes and they, they respond. I don't necessarily expect everybody to do that, but here's one of the things that I think is important when it comes to that is that at the very least, you check email in the mornings and you respond to all students there in the mornings and you check at night when the day or as the day winds up and you respond to everybody that goes through there too. And you wanna make sure that your students feel supported and that their concerns you respond to in a timely manner. And I think, uh, you know, again, if we don't do that in a face-to-face -face environment, that becomes uh, incredibly uh, frustrating for students and we don't wanna create those levels of frustration. So. Uh, it's something that I, I, I really find to be important. Other thing is, uh, you know, make sure that whatever you say you do, uh, more important than anything else, I mean, more important than uh, a lot of times when a face-to-face -face type thing, you can, you can rearrange things sometimes, but in an online environment, you're not necessarily uh, there in front of them all the time. So you need to make sure that you follow through and go through that. And, and, and kind of the follow through also means that you provide feedback on whatever work they're doing in that timely way. Because if you don't do that, that's, that's demotivating for the student. If you, they turn in a paper and they don't hear anything for two or three weeks, they don't know what they've done right or wrong. So we've got to make sure we do that. So I think setting those expectations in place with your faculty, reinforcing it uh, on a regular basis is going to be incredibly important because those are some foundational areas even outside the curriculum that help make for a better course, whether it be face-to-face -face or online, but we're kind of talking a little bit online right now. Now, with that, the actual um, topic of what we're going on there is not necessarily expectations, but assessment of course quality. And really and truly, when it comes to that, um, assessing course quality, I really think we need some feedback from uh, our UB friends here, because I don't know what is being used now to help assess course quality. Um, so if anybody, any of the UB, uh, or, or UB participants here can kind of share with us, currently at the University of Belize, what do you guys look at to determine whether a course is effective or not, even in a face-to-face -face environment? Well, at the university, we have um, four courses. We have the students do um, student evaluations at the end of the semester to evaluate the course. We also do focus group activities where about the fifth week, we go into the classroom, get a group of students and do a focus group assessment of the course, how the lecture is going. This is in an effort to identify any initial difficulties that they may be having and of course be able to say what they like what they dislike about the course and the way that the lecturer is teaching um, um, then we also have an in-class visit that happens later on in the semester or we do this for lectures once a year so it's not all courses that get assessed this way for the in-class visits that's more for one for the lecture um, and we go in and we sit down and and um, the administrators, the, the dean and the chair would go in and sit and, and sit through the class itself and, and get provide feedback to the lecturer about how the class is going and uh, what were the plus, what were some of the things, give them advice if needed, um, commend them on the good job that they're doing in other areas. No? But for the students, they do have the focus group and they do the end of the semester evaluation where they evaluate the, the course themselves. And then the lecturer at the end of the semester is required to write a course report where they self-evaluate the course that they delivered that semester. I think those are some very good um, uh, evaluations that come into place. I do think that students uh, are not shy about letting you know if they are unhappy with the course many times. Um, but I also think that being able to be visible and seeing that uh, when you're in a course, you know, Something that I've often said is that uh, if, if I'm walking into a classroom where teaching is going on, it oftentimes doesn't take me an hour to determine whether or not the instructor is, is performing at a very good basis. We oftentimes know within the first couple of minutes whether or not uh, that instructor is having an impact on that. And so, you know, these are all fairly uh, formative type assessments that go on as the things go through there, but uh, they certainly can provide that. Now, the coaching aspect 
uh, and how to improve them is the next part. And that is even tougher though, because we all take it a, uh, fairly personally in those situations. And there are ways to do that, obviously, but the coaching aspect can be tough. Do you guys have any, um, in, in, does Belize have national tests in some areas like for uh, teacher preparation or for nursing preparation or something, a national standardized test that is used at times? For the, for the instructors or for the people entering the professions? Uh, for the people entering the professions, for the students. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, for students entering the profession, they're for nursing, for pharmacy. I think there's a licensing procedure also for teachers. Okay. So they take a, a national exam? Uh, a licensing exam. Okay. And so does the university receive um, the scores that they do on those? Um, we do for, in our faculty, we would get reports on the the, pat, the, the grades of performance on the exams. The yeah. nursing exam is actually a regional exam yeah. in the, for the Caribbean. Okay. So I have a question. Um, as you're thinking about assessment of the courses and, you know, how do you evaluate the courses? How do you ensure, especially in those areas where there's a um, exam, like a certification exam for those entering the profession, how do you um, assess or measure the alignment of the courses and the objective of the courses to those um, exams? For nursing and, um, since this is, I'm within that faculty, for nursing and pharmacy, um, there's the, the regional curriculum for nursing, the blueprint, that the, our curriculum would be um, would look at. And for pharmacy, we work closely with the Ministry of Health. That's the, the, um, the body that, that is responsible for the pharmacy exam, which is a local licensing exam. So we work closely with, with those entities to align our curriculum. And again, with pharmacy there, the curriculum is developed on a regional guideline for basic education in pharmacy. So, and the, ex the, the exams would be looking at some of the basic competencies that would be required to enter these professions. So we teach, deliver above that, but we have to make sure that our curriculum is addressing some of those things. Would you say that uh, your courses are similar to courses at other institutions within the region? Yes. yes. So, so um, I have one more question, I guess, here, and then I'm, I'm going to ask um, uh, Dr. Oliveris and Dr. Odell to talk a little bit about uh, assessing course quality and, and how they feel that a lot of the data in place can help inform a lot of that. But I have one other area. Uh, do you, does UB have an accrediting body? Um, are you accredited by a, a particular group? So I see a, I see a shaking ahead of no at some point. And, and I know, and I didn't know if you had anything yet. I knew a couple of years ago that was a talk that you guys wanted to have an accrediting body and, and something to work with. And hopefully maybe uh, UT Tyler can help with that somewhere down the road. But when you get into and have an accrediting body, they're going to have many of your looking at certain student learning objectives and seeing how you're going to actually measure that and you'll have an ongoing and uh, longitudinal data that shows whether or not students are learning certain components of these regional uh, objectives that are brought out there. And so you can compare from year to year. And so even if you move to an online environment, you'll have some data right there to be able to look and say, okay, in this environment, we uh, showed success at a certain rate here. And now we're not quite doing as much. So we need to think about how we need to have that impact with students further as we move into uh, maybe new environments there. And so um, I think that when you look at accreditation, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna provide further data to determine whether or not the courses are there and the programs are working. Um, do you know, um, do y'all know what, which, uh, if you're talking about an accrediting agency, do you guys know which accrediting agency you're considering at this point? 
you be sorry <laughs> um you be last year launched its um route to accreditation and they decided to go with sat um, we are just in the initial stages of it though we're just doing the preparatory work and doing the the um, assessing where we are to then be able to move on to it okay yeah we uh we're accredited through sax as well um so that's uh that's interesting there's some definitely some good and bad to it all but uh the the process is probably very similar you guys can follow that we follow at some point so so with that um dr Oliveras or dr odell do you have any comments about using the data that is in here to assess course quality. Mike, it looks like it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I think I was mentioning to uh, Dr. Hickey earlier today that uh, I've experienced multiple accrediting bodies across the United States and SACS is clearly the most rigorous of the ones I've experienced. And when I was at Illinois, uh, we were in the Midwest and in uh, Northwest when I was in Idaho. And so I think that will help you with uh, uh, your outcomes because they're going to really make you get into your outcomes align. And you're, it sounds like you're already doing a lot of this. You're aligning to your um, assessments that your students have to take. The one thing I would look for is I would, uh, and I don't know how the university is situated, but within each college, I would do a, an audit of your curriculum to assure you're meeting the student learning outcomes that you'll kind of do that when you work through the SACS process and make sure you're aligning to what you want. Now, the I deal mainly in education. So one of the issues we have here is in our math department, for example, um, our students take all these math courses, but it's none of the math they need to teach school. And uh, so they get out in the field and yes, they can do Calc 3, but they we're never reintroduced to how you go back and do the sort of the things. So looking for gaps in your curriculum that, uh, and I don't know how much flexibility you have in changing your curriculum. The other thing that I always find is look for gatekeeper courses. Um, and what I mean by that is we run a report here and I've caused controversy over the years by releasing that report that, uh, 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 that shows like, a certain course, 70% of the kids always fail. And that impacts your enrollment in nursing or in or whatever, engineering, and people switch majors and become business majors or whatever. And so the question there, if you have courses like that, is it because the students aren't learning or is it structurally part of the course? Um, what we found or what I found was that the course instructor was overly, his, the grading policy was just way out there and you had to be a genius to pass the course. And so we were basically not letting kids move on into programs due to basically one instructor. And then, but I, I'll give you another example that's a little different. The biology department here said, we make all students take calculus one and calculus two. And uh, it wipes out about a third of our graduates, I mean, our program kids trying to after the sophomore year. But every course after Calc 1, they never use calculus in any course. So what was the purpose of calculus versus statistics or biostatistics or, or something like that? And they eliminated Calc 2 uh, because really all it was was a hoop that the, uh, or, uh, uh, that the students had to jump through to prove they were worthy of a biology degree. But it really had no impact on their biology degree. My initial training was a geologist. I had to take all those courses and that, not in any single geology course I ever took did I use calculus. It was, a, it was just a way to make people jump through hoops. And as a STEM advocate, we want more people in STEM. We don't want to filter out people, especially when the filter really isn't related to the, to the thing. So in nursing, that could happen. They could be taking a math course or a, you know, I, I'm making this up, a physical chemistry course, which they probably don't need, you know just to weed people out and where there's a shortage area i think you got to go in and what administrative or curricular barriers have we put in place that are negatively impacting our programs the second to that is then going and looking at individual courses and i'm notorious for sending faculty we're in the process of reevaluating some of our program because the world of education has changed and i sent everybody programs from other schools to say 
look at what they do, what's the same, what's different. Let's look at those things that are different. Why are they doing that? Should we be doing that? And, and, and since you've got a regional, it may be pretty well aligned in the US, things are not always very well aligned. Um, but we can learn from our sister institutions and our competitor institutions um, uh, to improve process, courses, rigor. Um, and so um, those are just some things that come to mind. I'd, I would obviously have to see more. Uh, so the other thing like here at our university, about five years ago, our engineers passed the professional engineering exam at about a 96% rate. Over the last few years, it's dropped down into the 50%. And so my question, if I was a dean, is what's going on? You know, um, is it an instructional problem? Is now faculty at most institutions are notorious for saying, well, the high school kids aren't ready. Yeah, but if we weed them all out after the freshman year, we're gonna be out of business pretty quick. And so a commitment on the part of faculty to actually teach students and take them from where they are to where they need to be, that's a, in some of the STEM areas, that's a hard, a sell to those faculty because um, they think you should just be smart enough to do it. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we do actually try to teach students how to do those courses. If they already knew how to do it, then they don't need our courses. So um, I've talked too much, but that's just kind of some things that come to mind. If I had things to look at, of course, I could, uh, I could uh, maybe provide some other things, but making sure you're aligned to your exams, making sure that you have no artificial barriers in your curriculum or courses that are not value added. Um, uh, now, I mean, I'm sure they take like a humanities course. Those things are valuable. I don't mean that. I'm just saying like uh, our computer science department for years kept teaching Fortran. Well, why? You know, nobody does Fortran, um, but they had some professor that didn't want to quit teaching their Fortran class. It's like, Okay, retro programming. Uh, I guess if another, you know, one of the satellites launched in the '60s breaks down, we can call on that person. But uh, so, just making sure that you're aligned with the times. Um, so, anyway, that's kind of what I had to add. I hope that was somewhat useful. Thank you, Dr. Odell. Uh, Dr. Oliveris, do you have anything you want to mention here? Well, um, a couple of years ago, we went through a program redesign, uh, and that activity was really helpful for us as the instructors. And um, Dr. Hickey was uh, the chair at the time. Uh, he was part of the process. But so we really looked at, we just sat down as a faculty and looked at the courses that we were teaching and looked at the um, standards that we had to follow. And I know there's no you know accreditation in in um, overall in the least, but it was focused on a, on the standards. Um, it was focused on the standards for teacher, for principal preparation. So we went through all the standards and made sure that our, we were covering all the standards throughout the courses. Uh, we found out that some of us were teaching some of the standards twice. Um, so we was repetitive. So that practice, that exercise was powerful. Um, generally, we looked at, at our courses and we knew what we were teaching, but we didn't know what others were teaching. Um, so it was really powerful to actually sit down as an entire faculty and look through our standards and make sure that we were covering all the standards to the level that they needed to be covered and not leaving. Like we found some standards that we were completely missing. Uh, like we, you know, like I had a professional learning community activity, but that was it for, for that standard. So we talked about how do we expand that. So I would encourage you, if you haven't done that lately, that um, to ensure that the quality of your program, it's not only, you know, good quality, but aligned to your standards, that you, you know, take the time to go over that. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that is a really good point. Um, you know, something that I find uh, occasionally is that, uh, instructors don't always know what the standards are they've uh they've gone through and taught it their way for so long that they haven't paid attention to any changes that have taken place over time so having a uh, curriculum alignment process with faculty is always a good thing to uh to improve course quality and really you know we talk about and i guess the second part was analyzing gaps and i think a lot of what we're talking about uh also certainly related to uh, finding where the gaps are, whether it be problems with standardized testing, like Dr. Odell said, with the engineering department, 
uh, other collected data, whether it be from uh, students through focus groups, through formal evaluations, through um, uh, curriculum audits, any of those type of things is trying to find where those gaps are. But I, I think really and truly is that when you see a consistent pattern of students scoring at a low level, that uh, it does indicate that there is a potential that either they're not getting it at all or they're not getting it sufficiently. And we, we need to look and see how to correct those over time. Um, any, uh, any questions on anything that we've talked about and uh, that we can, we can possibly answer here? I just wanted to add to what you guys were saying in that um, in my faculty, at the Faculty of Science and Technology, we currently went through those program reviews that you're talking about. We did the program review for several of our courses, of our programs, and these were then evaluated with, with, with um, true external partners. We had stakeholders within the country um, contribute to the, to the review. We also sent out our programs to be um, uh, reviewed internationally by other institutions in the U.S. and different areas. Um, we, what Dr. Oliver said was a big part of that, where lecturers sat down together and they looked at the delivery of the courses and the course content and saw the overlaps. And through that, we were able to then um, merge courses and bring about new ones as well. So that was all part of the program review process that we just undertook. So that's something that's ongoing within the university. Um, and a lot of what you said, they, when it came to moving on to accreditation, that is what we're doing. We're evaluating where our programs are.